lot of stuff to show you today. I'm going to show you some live demos, living dangerously, but that's the way I like it. So, um, and I thought I would start by telling you a little bit about um, who I am and where I come from. Um, as Anali said, I, I co-lead a research team here at Google, and our mandate is to do data visualization um, for end users. So, turning very complex data into really interesting images that people hopefully can understand without too much hand-holding, making complex data very legible and digestible. And you know, I, I, I work at Google, but the truth is I am a very unlikely technologist. Nothing in my past would ever tell you that I would end up here or doing what I do. Um, as Anali said, that's where I come from. I, I grew up in Rio. Um, ended up coming to Kansas. I did not know about the flat lands in the US or anything <laughs> like that. So, but I loved it, it anyway. Um, and my background is graphic design and art history, very traditional graphic design and art history. I had never, ever touched programming ever in my entire life, had no interest in actually. I loved things that were visual. So this was like a poster I did and a, and a book cover I did. But then when I was about to graduate, I decided I love visual things, but it started feeling a little limiting for me. And so that's when I learned about a place called the Media Lab, where they welcomed people with different backgrounds. Um, and so I that's when I started thinking, oh, maybe I should start picking up programming, this thing that people talk about. And so anyway, ended up doing a lot of data visualization. And data visualization is nothing more than uh, turning data like this, raw data, into pictures, right, that hopefully tell stories and bring together so many numbers in a way that your mind, that, that you work with your visual system to digest. Um, this is what, it, what data visualization used to be. So when I started in the field, this is what visualization used to be. It was very scientific, and it was very, very male-dominated. And it was sort of like serious technology for serious people, you know, only experts. Also because it was hard. It was, it was expensive to be able to, to run graphics uh, of, any, of any kind. Thankfully, this is very different now. Right, so now you have all sorts of different kinds of visualization projects. You have um, visualizations that are artistic. You have visualizations that are journalistic. Um, you have entire reports that are done through data visualization and infographics. You have visualization being used for activism. And I am very interested in this arc, in this change that goes from a very sort of serious discipline uh, that is, that's very limited uh, to something that becomes more of a, um, you know, mainstream communication media welcoming people to the world of data. That's one of the things that I love about data visualization is that it can be sort of like a gateway to statistics, like a gateway drug to statistics, right? You're doing statistics without having to have a degree, without having to, you know, to learn about distributions and such. So I'm going to start by showing you one of, one of my favorite projects. Um, <clears throat> and this was done before I even came to Google. So it's called the Web Seer. And oh, and one little note. Um, all the work I'm going to show here today, it's work that I didn't do by myself. It's work that I did with my partner, Martin Wattenberg. Uh, we've been working together for like 10 years. And so when you, when I, when you hear we, that's what I mean. It's, it's me and Martin and my team also. But this was done way before Google, before we joined Google. We started noticing that the Google Instant, right? You start typing things into Google, and it starts giving you suggestions. Any clue about why Google does that? Why does Google give you suggestions? So you have a better search experience because it's faster, because you know maybe this way you don't have to waste time uh, typing everything. Um, and these suggestions are the most popular things, the most popular queries that people have come to Google with given the beginning of your string, right? So if you say why, well, these are the things that people usually ask Google about why. So I want to actually do one little thing here. I'm going to show you a visualization of the same kind of data. 
So now I'm going to say y. And I'm visualizing the same, the same data, OK? But I'm going to say y doesn't he. And you can, you can see that I'm showing the same information that Google is showing you, but I'm also showing you a sense of priorities. OK, so why doesn't he like me is the top thing that uh, comes after why doesn't he. But now I want to do another thing. I want to combine that query with another one. I want to compare and say, why doesn't she? And now the visualization is showing me where these two come together and where they break apart, right? So why doesn't he or she love me or like me or text me first is interesting. But why doesn't she just leave is only for she's. <laughs> uh, so you know, you start to get a sense of, of um, interesting things. Um, and you can play with this. This is a public visualization. You can play with this. Um, you know, is chocolate, chocolate versus is coffee, right? And you can start to see what people are worried about, right? Um, but then you can get to more serious things, like is my son versus is my daughter and you can you you can <laughs> you get a sense of people's vulnerabil vulnerabilities right of parents coming to google and actually asking these questions and this is something that i love about data is that data can seen can be seen as something so cold and removed but when you look at a picture like this it's not it's like, oh my god, it just hits you, right? Um, the good news is that if you turn that from a question, is my son versus is my daughter, to an affirmative, my son is versus my <laughs> daughter is, uh, the best and awesome you know, is, is um, still some of the top, the top things you get there. Um, so again, this is just to give you a sense of the kind of visualization I'm interested in. I'm interested in visualization that resonates culturally with people and sort of takes you out of that notion of, oh, you know, uh, data is something boring. Um, I want to show you another, another visualization. This is something that we did here at Google. And this is a map, a real-time map, of the top viral YouTube videos in the US right now. OK? So, and I'm showing you what, and, and it's by region. So let's look at Boston. This is a, a region for Boston and Manchester and New Hampshire. So this, you know, do-it-yourself Orbeez slime <laughs> video is the top one that people care about right now in our, in our region. Um, and, but the top one is this video game one. I'm going to break it down by interesting um, demographics. So let's look at what males are looking at. Oh, this is 13s to 17 year olds, OK? All right. <laughs> it's going to it's get better, I promise. Uh, so males are looking at this. Uh, female youngsters are looking at the ones that the Bostonians like the most. Um, but it, as I go over older um, demographics, it changes completely, right? So this is what older ladies are looking at, uh, little big shot sassy viral dancer video. Um, and uh, males are all looking at this Trump supporter punching a protester in the face. Um, there's other things, too, that are very local. So like this video here about flooding. Uh, another one uh, also about flooding, very local. Um, so this map changes um, every day. It's, it's live data. And you can see things that sweep the nation, which is really interesting to me. So let me just go back to my presentation here. Let me do this. OK, so I just wanted to call attention to um, a couple of you know, historical screenshots. So this was last year, or a year and a half ago, I, I forget, when um, you know, males were looking at the Men of Steel uh, movie trailer. And then, oops, and then females on the same day were looking at the Dove Real Beauty uh, commercial. Does anyone, has anyone seen that? Yeah, yeah, right? Me too. When this was happening, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm part of the demographic. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, that's true. Um, and then you have things like these that you can't make up. <laughs> 
grandma's smoking weed for the first time. And it just like sweeps the country, right? <laughs> And it's awesome, I, I watched the video. But one of the things that was cool is, uh, is to actually see that not only cat videos uh, go viral on YouTube. That was, that was a relief. Um, OK. Um, let me talk about uh, a different kind of, um, in a sense, both visualizations I showed you to this point were sort of real time-ish. Um, the, the Google Instant is, is an aggregate. Uh, the, the, YouTube is, is real time. Um, this is a very different kind of, of visualization. Uh, a few years ago, Martin and I were um, approached by the Boston uh, Magazine. And they said to us, can you create a visualization of Boston for us uh, on, the printed mag on the print magazine? So it was not interactive. We love doing things that are interactive. So this is even more challenging. How do you visualize an entire city on a piece of paper? So we started thinking about Boston, and one of the things that struck us is the seasonality, right? OK, great. How do you get that through data? So we decided to go to Flickr and look at, scrape all the public um, pictures of the Boston Common, OK, that were licensed under the Creative Common license. Uh, and we scraped that for entire year's worth. So we had photos for. January, for February, for, for an entire year of the, of the park, right? And then what we did is we started counting the number of pixels that were different colors. So for the bin of January, how much white is there? How much red? How much blue? OK? So this is just a color cube. And this is how we divided the color cube. And, and basically, by counting the pixels, some of these cubes became bigger. Some of these cubes got smaller. Okay, And then we decided we would sort of have this over a whole year and overlay each hue on top of each other. Okay, And then we decided, because it's a yearly thing, it's a cyclic thing, we decided to put it on a, on, on a circular um, format. And this is what a whole year of Boston Common ended up looking like. So at the bottom here, this is January. <laughs> and you can see <clears throat> that on the Boston Common, there's a lot of you know, uh, snow, <laughs> right? Um, as you start getting closer to spring here, you get this fuchsia uh, layer. And this is, this is a lot of the flowers that are blooming um, in the park. You get this bulge of greens here for the beginning of summer. And then it flows into sort of like more towards the, the fall foliage um, over here. So this is our way of, of trying to capture a year's worth of Boston uh, through looking at the Boston Common. We were very happy because since we were working with data that wasn't ours, right? We were just scraping from the web. It's very noisy data, right? People don't go to the Boston Common just to take pictures of the foliage. They take pictures of their kids or of the carousel or of you know the frog pond, whatever. Um, and so it was totally unknown to us whether we would have any signal, right, that would tell the story that we were interested in in terms of seasons. And if you broke this very flowy thing into the different seasons, you can see that the distribution of colors is actually dramatically different, right, between summer and, and winter and, and so forth. OK. And then I want to finish with one project that um, <clears throat> is very interesting to us. So before the awful winter we had last year, there was another winter that was not nearly as mild as this one. I'm so happy about this winter. Um, and so Martin and I were thinking, you know, weather, is there anything we can do with weather? Um, and we decided there's a lot of, there are tons of, of data about wind, about weather. Is there anything interesting we can do? Well, the truth is, wind has been visualized for hundreds of years, right? And so these are sort of traditional visualizations of the wind. Um, and they tended to be static and sort of like vector field based, right? Um, <clears throat> And so you do get a sense of direction. You do, by the length of each arrow, you do get a sense of speed. But still, it's hard to get a gestalt, right? To get an overview and sort of like, oh, yeah, this is where there is a little you know, 
round thing going over here. This is where there's a major um, <clears throat> uh, pattern and so forth. So we decided to play with this idea of even though wind has been visualized for, visualized for hundreds of years, is there anything we can do that's new on the web and that is more dynamic or feels more like this movement of, of the wind? And so let me show you what we ended up doing. So this is the wind map. It's a live visualization of the wind over the US right now. Um, <clears throat> and it's public and it's always there. And it, by keeping a lot of the detail, by not averaging everything out into a vector field and keeping animation, um, you do get a much more texture sense of the wind and how there are these broad strokes in the middle of the country, but then how over here in the West, even though we're not showing you anything about the way the land is, you can still see the tracery of the mountains there, right? And then you can start to play with this and zoom in. <clears throat> and you can see here Boston, and we're doing great because we are not having too much wind. And wind is coming from the south up, which is awesome because it makes for that nice warm weather. Um, but then another thing that was interesting to us is just how much the wind changes. So day to day. So we ended up creating a, a small gallery of different days of wind. And, and so you get things like this, where you know this is a day where like Canada was stealing our air, and <laughs> not even the mountains were, were stopping them. Um, and this is very unusual. Like this is, this is like a, a very different kind of day. Um, you also have days like these where there's a lot of stuff going on on different parts of the country. Um, and um, you just, you know, it's like the wind parts in different ways, sort of like how you part your hair uh, different days. And, and then you have stuff like this, where you start zooming in. And this is, um, this is Hurricane Isaac man making landfall. And because this is a real time visualization, you know, this was running and we were starting to get emails from people. Uh, you know, like I remember this one person said, I live here in New Orleans and I'm looking at your visualization. I'm just praying that this thing just stops, just blows over us and we're okay. And that was a really powerful moment because we had never had a visualization that was real time where seeing this felt so, made us connect to, to people in different parts of, of the country. It wasn't until we had this guy that we realized what it meant. Uh, so this was um, Sandy also making landfall. And for this, you know, for the first time, we were in the path. Um, and so this was interesting because it was, a, it was a visualization that sort of could be scary. We had never had the situation before. Um, and so I want to tell you a little bit about the reaction that we got for this visualization. Oh, yeah, and the other thing um, that just because that's my, you know, that's what I do. I visualize data. One of the things that I think is really interesting is the data on these images is exactly the same data as on these images, right? And so the way in which you approach something makes a big difference. Um, one of the things that we're not doing here, that we're try striving to do here, is to show as much detail of the data as possible to not aggregate the data as much as possible. And that has, already, has a bunch of pitfalls because it could create a much more complex visualization than people can understand. But in a fascinating way, I would say that the complexity, the visual complexity of these pictures here actually helps your eyes. It's sort of like when you have more pixels in your camera, it just like focuses. To me, it's sort of the same thing. It's like, oh, finally, I can see these broad, um, patterns of wind that actually now I 
seeing them all at once makes sense to me. Um, so we started getting a lot of email, a lot. Like we have never gotten this much email before. And so it turns out that farmers, we did this as an art piece. We just put it on the web and we thought it was gonna be this completely sort of niche thing. It's like, who cares about wind, right? I, I didn't before I <laughs> did this visualization, but it turns out a ton of people do. So farmers will look at this visualization before spraying their crops. Um, scientists, We'll look at the visualization for bird migration, for butterfly migration. Teachers love to show this to kids and to try to uh, sit with them and try to think about forecasts, weather forecasts, and you know, can is this a, a week that's prone to tornadoes and, and things like that. Pilots um, started looking at this visualization uh, before flying, and then. When we started, both commercial and military pilots, by the way. And so when we got those emails about the pilots, we're like, whoa, whoa, no, no, no. <laughs> Do not look at this map before you fly your plane. We very specifically say that we are showing surface wind, right? So surface wind is from the Earth to like 10 meters. It's like, you're going to fly your plane way above that. And that's not going to be the wind, right? They know that. They know that. But it just got a little bit too scary for us. Like um, wildfire firefighters would look at the visualization before deciding on their strategy. And so something that started as our curiosity about the wind um, ended up being a utilitarian tool for people without us knowing. And it is great. At the same time, you feel like you're on the hook because uh, what if your visualization isn't right? Right? So we put a disclaimer. We said, do not use this map for flying a plane, sailing a boat, or fight wildfires. Because we got multiple emails about each one of those things. Um, and we thought, OK, just, just FYI, we have this disclaimer. Then we started getting emails where they're like, we understand that you know, it's your thing, but respect the power of the visualization. Um, and so, <clears throat> so this just to me is a really interesting moment because what it tells me is that we are coming in an interesting other end of the arc I was talking to you about before, right? When I started working in this field, we were very much in the, this is scientific, for scientists only, for experts only. And now I am so proud that we have ways of talking about data, of looking at data, where we are embracing so many more communities, where it's not about whether you're doing science or not, or whether about you're running a government or not, but it is about your life, right? It's how, how you appropriate the data. How do you make use of it? How do you become a better consumer, a more skeptical consumer of data? And so that's what excites me about this kind of work. It's sort of like, how can we use these powers, right? How can we use data for our own benefits as, as, as citizens um, and, and, and become better um, at it? And I think visualization can play an awesome role there. So that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. We're going to have a few minutes here for questions and answers. We have a couple. Um, runners with speaker with little, what are they called? Microphones. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so yes. Hi. Thank you yep. very much. I just had a quick question. When you started, no, I'm sorry. I wanted to oh. uh, ask oh, of you. Oh, definitely. You started off your um, talk about uh, talking about diversity and oh. how that Google, you know, embraces it and everything. I have read over, I think, the last year or so. Um, I guess some not very good statistics sure. about um, diversity in high tech companies yep. and you know how that you know women make up only like 5% of the engineers at all these high tech companies i just wanted to know if you could talk about um, sort of where google stands in that and is is google any better or worse than your um, compatriots hi Hi, Annalie. Hi, Hi, Fernanda. Sorry Hi. to steal that. I just wanted to take that because I'm a, one of the members of the diversity team here. So thank you for that question. It's super important. Um, for those of you who don't know or may not have seen it, 
around this time last year, Google released our public numbers around diversity, gender, and I believe also some ethnicity numbers. Um, so I would say reference that for the most up-to-date statistical information, and I believe we will be refreshing that around the same time this year. So you guys can be looking out for that um, until that information comes out. We can't talk specifically about the actual numbers, um, but if you have questions about last year's numbers, Oh, I would just say for all of those details, check out the website. The reports are all there, and they're much more um, elaborate than I could be right now. Um, I would say for this Q&A, if we could just focus it on for non disc content. Um, and if you guys have other diversity questions, just feel free to let us know. Um, my name is Ani. I just wanted to ask you, Fernanda, about your work particularly. You mentioned about visualizations and statistics. And I was wondering, from my knowledge of it, how do you deal with, because with visualizations, you can show powerful information, but you can also mislead. Um, because there are outliers, there's a section sample of overall big picture. I was just wondering, how do you deal with that in your work? What are the strategies that you try to make sure that the final product avoids the potential misleading? Yeah, so it's true. So visualization, as with any other media, you can mislead with words, you can mislead with pictures, and you can mislead with, with visualization. So we try hard to make sure that we have checks and balances uh, for um, whatever data we work with. Um, and there are different levels at which we do that. So for instance, we have user studies where we show things to people, and we try to understand from their perspective what are they getting from the representation we chose. It's, I'll give you a very specific example. I didn't show this project today, but we have launched, uh, last year we launched with Google Sheets, the ability to automatically visualize your data. So when you open Google Sheets, now if we identify a data table, we'll automatically visualize it and verbalize things about your data. Verbalization meaning we will say things that are of interest on your, about your data. So we started saying things like, oh, this is growing exponentially by 2%. And then we realize that lay users do not understand that. What do you mean an exponential growth of 2%? An exponential growth is an explosive growth, right? So we had to reword things uh, because our uh, jargon was not making sense uh, to end users. I'll say another thing that we did a long time ago. We created, this was not at, at, at Google. This was when I was at, at IBM. We created the first website where anyone could come upload data and create interactive visualizations of, of their data and share with others. And when we presented that at the top academic conference on visualization, on data visualization, it was a half and half split. Some people were really excited about the ability of giving, of making this technology available to end users, to anyone without training. And half of the people were like, are you crazy? How dare you put these visualization techniques in the hands of non-experts? They're going to mislead. They're going to come up with the wrong conclusions. They're going to visualize the data in the wrong way. To which I say, let them. Because if we don't make these tools available, then people are not going to learn. I want people to make little mistakes with data play with things before they make big mistakes with data at government or at industry. I want to have a pipeline where kids, so in this, in this website, kids were playing with data, right? And that's the kind of pipeline that I think is important for you to grow as a consumer of data, as a consumer of data visualization. You have to become more skilled and the only way to become skilled, I think, one of the most effective ways is to play with it yourself, right? So yes, I'm sure people will make mistakes, but I welcome them, right, before it become big mistakes. Like, I want little mistakes. Hi. Hi. Ana Maria. Um, your presentation is incredible, by the way. And you come from a very creative background, it seems like, and you've made this transition to sort of like cutting edge cutting edge data analytics. 
What advice do you have for someone who wants to make the same type of transition and perhaps what obstacles did you have to surmount of any sort of coming from one background and going into another but staying true to what you love it's just in a different context so can you talk about your journey and your obstacles yeah so as i as i said i had never programmed before like i programmed very very little before i got to mit uh i so i'll give you so yes there were lots of hurdles and it was hard it, so I think, I think one of the things that helped me was hoping that I was, I was going to learn this stuff um, and believing that I could. But I, I, I remember being in, in this one software engineering class at MIT and just like crying my eyes out because I was just like, I am the dumbest person in this entire class, in this entire institute. I'm never going to get this. And then just working and working on it on and and until i got until until programming started to sink a little bit um, i think the most important thing is being open and understanding that getting out of your comfort zone is hard but it's okay i feel like i never grew as much as when i went from graphic design to the media lab where i was exposed to all these all these intellectual tools I had never been exposed to before, right? And all these different ways of thinking. It's hard work, and, it, and in my case, it hurt a lot. <laughs> maybe in other people, maybe other people are just like more naturally prone to, you know, going from visual to uh, very mathematical thinking. Um, but it's worth it. I feel like it was the best thing was to have these two very different perspectives. And, and just finding that connections are where the excitement is, really. I think there's a question all the way there. Um, <clears throat> for someone who's interested in learning more about making data visualizations, are there specific tools or libraries or things that you should learn about um, to move forward? <clears throat> yes. Um, there's some really nice tools uh, and communities at this point. Uh, so one, I, I, two things I recommend. One is the processing community. Um, there's processing JS, and there's a very strong community uh, there. And people are happy to answer questions, um, and uh, just the community aspect is great. If you already know a little bit of front-end uh, programming and you just want to go, oh, what is you know visualization libraries? Then I would say D3 is the way to go. It's not super welcoming of newbies, I guess, but it's uh, but but the good thing about D3, I'll say this, is they have an amazing set of examples, and so you can just reuse the code. You can start. You don't have to start from scratch, which is awesome. And D3 is what everybody, like the pros, use. So it's great. Hey, so just um, asking more library questions. Um, where do you think WebGL is trending in the future? And what do you think are like the late, the sort of hottest libraries, whether it's 3JS or um, you know, something that is a little less mature than D3? OK. So are you specifically interested in, D3, in T 3D things? or? Okay, so I would say definitely. Uh, de um, oh my God! Now I'm getting all confused in my library names here. Um, one of the things for me is that I do a lot of do two D. Uh, work so even WebGL. I'm just now getting started with with WebGL. And one of the things I'll, I'll say about WebGL is that I'm actually starting to learn it, so I can do do to the things <laughs> with it. And I think that is a really interesting. Oh, okay, all right, uh, that's a really interesting next step for these 3D libraries. Is to how can we co-op them for 2D work? Um, and so. Um, what is you mentioned? Uh, is it JS three JS? Yes, that's that's one that I would definitely. Uh, that's one of the ones we're ex uh, we're exploring with, and we've had the biggest um, 
sort of return on investment so far. So I'll definitely look into that.